Uh, dear friends, Salam Alaikum. We meet today on the 15th of uh, July, the year 2024. Today I am with uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein, and we are going to discuss a very important topic. The topic of our discussion today will be about the World War I and the Ahirul Zaman. Now, many of you might ask, uh, what does uh, World War I has to do with Ahir Zaman? But World War I <coughs> has been very important in the history of religion in our planet. Until the year 1914, in Europe, we had three major empires, which in a way served as protectors of Islam and Christianity. We have the Habsburgs or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which served as the protector of uh, Catholic Christianity. On the other hand, we had the Tsarist Russia, where the Russian Tsardom, for those who have followed scholars like Alexander Dugin, you probably know that the Russian Tsardom was established as the third Rome, and according to the Christian eschatological view, according to Orthodox Christians, uh, the Russian Tsardom was perceived as, <coughs> in a way, the, revi uh, the rebirth or the revival of uh, Constantinople, which was taken by the Muslims. And finally, we had the Ottoman Sultanate, or Caliphate as well. Even though Sheikh Imran is somehow critical of the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman mythology claimed that since the year 1517, when Sultan Selim I took Cairo from the Mamluks, the Ottomans inherited from the Abbasids the title of the Caliph. The title of the Caliph was very important for Muslims, because from the era of uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr to the last Ottoman Sultan and Caliph, Muslims always had someone who was claiming to represent them. But World War I brought a major earthquake for the three main monotheistic religions of our planet. We'll have the Ottomans, who will be, I mean, the state, uh, the, the power in the Ottoman state will be hijacked by the Jean Turks, and we will have a triumvirate of three Jean Turk atheist fascists, people like Enver Pasha, Jamal Pasha, and Talal Pasha. And these three Jean Turk commanders, they are going to make the Ottoman Empire join World War I on the side of Austro-Hungary and Germany. But as the war will progress, the Austro-Hungarian, Germanic, and Ottoman uh, coalition will be defeated, and the British, the French, the Italians, and the Americans are going to triumph. While Russia, at first, will join the Anglo-American alliance, during the course of the war, the Russian Tsardom will be demolished. And we will have a very important year, the year 1917. In 1917, we will have a very enigmatic Jewish personality by the name Alexander Parvus, the person who is going to even be one of the founders of the Jean Turks, and who will play a very important role on toppling of Sultan Abdul Hamid in Istanbul, this very same personality will manipulate the German uh, secret service, and he will secure funding for the Bolsheviks, who, under the leadership of Lenin, they will be sent to St. Petersburg. 
in the year 1917, we will have the end of the centuries-old Russian Tsardom. Tsar Nicholas II will be taken hostage by the Bol Bolsheviks, who in 1918, they are going even to execute him and, he, and his family. In 1918, we will have the British and the French who will invade Istanbul or Constantinople, and the Ottoman Sultan and Caliph will be taken as hostage by the British. And from this moment onward, Muslims will no longer have a, an Ottoman Sultan or Caliph who will claim to be their representative, and the so-called Ottoman Caliphate will come to an end. In 1917, we'll have the death of the Russian Tsardom. The Russian Tsar, he claimed to be the Holy Roman Emperor, representing Christians and defending Orthodox Christianity, like the Ottoman Sultan had the same claim. And in 1918, we'll have even the defeat and the dismemberment of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Austro-Hungarian emperors, they were the defenders of Catholicism. Especially since the Italian Revolution of 1870s, when Italian Masons under Garibaldi, they will defeat the papal state, Catholic Christianity is going to lose its pontifical state or its religious state, which was the papal state. And the year 1917 will bring a new development in the history of mankind. While we will see the disappearance of the empire of Islam, the empire of orthodoxy and empire of Catholicism, we'll have the British who are going to invent Israel. In November 1917, British Foreign Secretary Alfred Balfour will issue a letter promising to the Zionist lobby of uh, Europe and to Lord uh, Lionel Rothschild the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. What will happen is that in 1918, the Austrian, German, Ottoman bloc will be defeated we will have the dismemberment of the Habsburg and Ottoman Empire, and we will see the colonization of Muslims. The British, the French, Balkan nation states are going to invade territories from Kosovo to Palestine, from Egypt to Syria. And the colonial powers, they're going to create new realities. But from this moment onward, Orthodox Christians, they will no longer have the holy Russia which will defend them. And Muslims will no longer have the Ottoman Sultan. So today with Sheikh Imran, I want to discuss this. I mean, what is his view? Because, I mean, what happened in 19... 17 and 18 was something of monumental change which was never seen before in the history of mankind. We'll see suddenly a small group of Jews who by using the British Empire, they will change the realities of the Muslim world and they'll take control of the Holy Land. I'm sorry, Chef, for my lengthy historical introduction but I believe that uh, your theological understanding can enlighten our viewers. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, uh, and uh, I am tremendously happy, thrilled that we are discussing this subject today, Dr. Olsi. I have waited a long, long time <laughs> for someone with your scholarship. Uh, who, with whom I can engage on a discussion on this very important period of history. 
uh, before we proceed, I want to, because I don't want to forget, I want to offer a suggestion to you. My opinion is that the subject is so tremendously important that we need to teach the subject to our people in a teaching seminar. So I want to organize a complete one week, a teaching seminar and advertise it and as many as possible who want to come and join us for one week to teach the subject and that you would take charge of the historical part, the political history of the subject and I would contribute the Islamic eschatological part of the subject and that we invite other scholars who can join with us uh, maybe right here in Malaysia, which is so welcoming, and you are already here, and I'm comfortable with Malaysia. So if you are in agreement, I'd like to discuss this with you and try to organize a seminar, a teaching seminar on this period of history in which the First World War is so pivotally located. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say on this, the eighth day of the month of Muharram of the year 1446, is that in order for us to study this subject effectively, we need to bring the two scholarships together. Scholarship in political history and scholarship in the Quran and the Sunnah, that is, Islamic eschatology or ilmu akhir zaman and both of us are eminently qualified to do that to try to harmoniously integrate the two subjects we may not always agree but there will be tremendous benefit in such a dialogue and a harmonious integration of the two scholarships having said that let me put it into the record what I have consistently said for 20, 25 years now, but maybe of recent times I've not been repeating it, that there was a model of a state which came with Nabi Muhammad and that model of state did not come with him for the first time. That model of a state came for the first time with Nabi Dawood the Prophet David, and that culminated with the Prophet Nabi Suleiman the Prophet Solomon, and it was called Holy Israel. And the Islamic State in Medina was a replica of that state. What was most important about the profile of that state is that it was not a secular state. It was a state which recognized the supreme authority of the Lord God and the truth came from him and it was absolute truth and the state was founded on truth. The legal system was based on truth. The system of governance was based on truth. And then that model of a state left the Arab world and went to Constantinople. And I am not, <laughs> I have to confess that I'm not comfortable really with the Khilafah, Islamic Khilafah leaving the Arab world. But it left and it went to Constantinople. And I accept that the external form of the Khilafah state existed in the Ottoman Empire until 1924. This is not something new that I'm saying. I've been saying, I've written on this subject, that the external form and structure of the Khilafah state existed in Constantinople with the Ottoman Islamic Empire until 1924. My criticism has not been with the external form. My criticism has been that this was a monarchy, a family rule, 
and this was not the first time that family rule came. Family rule came from the time when Mawia appointed his son Yazid to, re to succeed him. And family rule is still there in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf and so on. And we do not have family rule in Islam, no. The external form of the model of the state existed in the Ottoman Empire until 1924. And what replaced it was a model of a state which came from modern Western civilization. And it is that model of a state which is now universally applied all over the world. And this model of a state existed for the last time and ended with the Ottoman Empire. Let me put that into the record. So despite whatever criticisms I make of Ottoman warfare and the code of conduct in warfare, this does not detract from the fact that I have recognized that the model of a state was, was that of a Khilaf state, external form. Secondly, it is in the record that for the last 25 years I've been saying it, and I'm not the only one. I think it was the, the uh, um, a university in New York, um, upstate New York, and the, the scholars in that university uh, went on record to declare that the last free and fair market that mankind ever experienced before modern Western civilization came with their bogus monetary system and their bogus banking system. The last free and fair market that existed in the world was the market of the Ottoman Empire. And credit must be given to them for that. So now then, having put that into the record, the period of time that you are, you are directing attention to is one in which the Ottoman Empire disappeared from the map of the world. And for me, what is most important about that disappearance of the Ottoman Empire has nothing to do with Osman. <laughs> it is the model of a state that came with Nabi Dawood -Islam, Nabi Muhammad -Islam, and which was preserved with all its defects until 1924, that model has disappeared. And we in Islamic eschatology, we say that the model of a state we now have does not represent truth which has come from the Lord God. Uh, also, the, when I was a doctoral student at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, uh, the director of the institute, Professor Jean Fr Fr Jacques Fremont, he liked me very much like a son to him. And I chose him, I asked him to be my thesis director. But I chose the topic, post-caliphate Islam and the search for a new Islamic public order, and I had no knowledge of Islamic eschatology at that time. Professor Fremont said to me, Imran, go search the world of Islam and find an expert on this subject. And I will invite him to join the team for your doctoral thesis. And I searched and I could find no one <laughs> because I did not know at that time that the model of a state which has replaced the Islamic Khilafah was a bogus model. And from our Islamic eschatological perspective, it came from the false messiah, Masih al-Dajjal, and it's not going to last for long again. We have a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad wasalam, that a great war is going to come, and that great war is around the corner. The president of Serbia declared about a week or two ago, he said, I expect that great war within the next three, one, three months. I don't know when the great war will take place, but nuclear war. 
And what our prophet has said, and we need to remind our people around the world, that not only is that war around the corner, we don't know how soon, but he said that immediately after that war, either seven months or seven years, a Muslim army will march to conquer Constantinople. And he praised that army and he praised the commander, indicating that the world of Islam, which today is in slumber, in chains, as soon as the great war takes place, the world of Islam is going to rise up again. A revival will take place as soon as the great war takes place. And once that revival begins, that is goodbye to the nation states with which we now are cluttered. Malaysia and Indonesia and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and all. And when the Imam comes, Imam al-Mahdi, it is that model of a state which will be revived. The model of a state which we lost in Constantinople in uh, 20 in 1924. That model of a state which came with Nabi Dawood al-Islam and with Nabi Suleiman al-Islam. So what we need to do is to teach our people that there is no post-caliphate new model of a state that I was looking for in my PhD thesis. Not at all. Rather it is the revival of the Khilafah state that we have to look forward to. Having said that, my response to you, uh, Dr. Osley, is that our Islamic eschatological perspective tells us that there was a mastermind at work. And that mastermind planned the Great, world, the great War of 1914 to 17. The planning was there long before and was very visible. They, they planned in France, for example, using every single crooked way that they could to put a regime in place in France that would be sympathetic and supportive of their cause. And uh, they planned the First World War, Osley, not because of any primary interest in redrawing the map of Europe. No. The, the primary purpose, the primary goal that they sought to achieve in the First World War was Jerusalem. That is our Islamic perspective. Uh, I have only one more thing to add before we continue. And that is that the Quran tells us that when Pharaoh was drowning, just before he died, underneath the water, <coughs> he declared that he's no longer God. <laughs> before this, he had said, Ana rabbukum al -a'la, I am the Lord God Most High. But now that he's dying, he realizes he's not God. And uh, he, saw, he now declares, I believe in the God of Moses and of Arun al-Islam. And this is what the Quran says. Um, it is in Surah to Yunus, I believe, yes. Ba'da'uzu billahi min al-shaytanir rajim. This is perhaps the most important verse of the Quran to guide today's dialogue between us. Al An, now Pharaoh, now, now you make this declaration. Wakad Asay Takabu, and before this, you were in such arrogant rejection, obstinate rejection. Wakuntam in al Mufsidin, and you were so wicked in your conduct. Corrupting the land and destroying the land. Today, Pharaoh, I have decided that I am going to preserve your physical body. 
that when your phys physical body is discovered, when it resurfaces in history, that physical body and that moment in history will function as a sign from me for a people to come after you. But most people are heedless of my signs. So, Dr. Usli, what is the sign? The body of Pharaoh was discovered not accidentally, but by divine design in the very year that the Zionist movement was born in 1897. The very year or the very time that the Zionist movement was born in Basel, in Switzerland, on that same year, that same time, let's not fight boxing matches over a day or two. The, the very time when that body, that, that Zionist movement was established, in Basel, in Switzerland, that was when the body of Pharaoh was discovered. So now then, what is the sign? It is one of the remarkable things of the Quran that Allah constantly invites us to think. He says that this Quran was sent to people who think. And one of the remarkable things of Islamic scholarship today is that it has negative views towards people who think. The great, great, great scholars we have had of the modern age have been people who have defied traditional Islamic scholarship, like Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, and who have dared to think. So what was the sign? That when body, the body of Pharaoh is discovered, a timeline of events will now unfold in which history will repeat itself. Musa alayhis salam and the Israelite people were fleeing and they reached the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army armed to the teeth were pursuing them and they were trapped they were cornered there was no way out they were in a hopeless position they were between the devil and the dark blue sea and then a miracle occurred a divine intervention in military and political affairs took place and Allah said to Musa al-Islam, take your staff and strike the water. The water then parted and the water rose like mountains on both sides, but the land in between was dry. And Moses, Nabi Musa al-Islam and the Israelite people were able to pass to safety. I'm repeating these words today so that Israel would listen. And when Pharaoh attempted to follow through that part, then the waters came down and they were drowned. History will now repeat itself from, 90, from 1897. That a, 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 a timeline of events will now unfold in which those who have faith and who lead the believers, that is Imam al-Mahdi and uh, the Muslims, will now be cornered. The events are going to control in which the First World War was a pivotally important one. And when the Israeli forces have cornered the Imam, and there is no hope for him, and they're moving in for the kill, as Pharaoh was moving in for the kill. History will now repeat itself. 
and the, the, the Messiah will return, a miraculous event, and he will kill the false Messiah. This is at the heart of our subject. And I wanted to bring this verse of the Quran from Surah to Yunus to put it into our discussion so that we'll now be able to look at events. And this is where you take over, Ulsli, because you've got the scholarship that I don't have. That from, 90, from 1897, so 1902 is only five years. If the Zionist movement is to achieve its goal of the establishment of a Jewish state in the Holy Land, you've got to topple the Ottoman Caliphate. And all the forces that were hostile to Sultan Abdul Hamid assembled in Paris in 1902. And the Russian Turks. And we need your scholarship now, not mine. We have to try to bring to the table the strategies they employed that by 1908, correct me if I'm wrong, by 1908 they brought the revolution. And by 1909 perhaps, mm -hmm. Sultan was deposed. And he was jailed at the house of a Salatini family, mm -hmm. which was a Jewish family. Jewish family. Saloniki or Salonika. Salonika, yeah. We need so to they know. send the Sultan or the Caliph of Ottomans to humiliate him yeah. into the house yeah. of a Jewish family. Yeah. Now we know. We know that there were Jews involved in that conference in 1902. But there are Jews who are part of the Zionist movement, and there are Jews who are opposed to the Zionist movement. It's your scholarship we are depending on to analyze that conference in 1902, the period of time between 1902 and 1908. I bought a book on that subject. Also, it cost me 300 US. And I don't know who. Somebody borrowed the book, and I don't have it anymore. Then we have 1909 when the Sultan is deposed. As far as I'm concerned, the Caliphate is gone. Correct. Because you have a figurehead now Correct. Uh, in 1909. And okay. you have the Jean Turks who take power. Yeah. Who, yeah. Are, who are atheists by it. <laughs> yeah, it is. And then you have the period from 1909 to 1914 when the essentially godless people were ruling the Ottoman Empire. And that's when the Armenian genocide took place, okay? What was the role of Russia in well, provoking the Armenian genocide? Well, uh, before going into that, I want to uh, ask you for something else. Because the year 1917 and 18 is very important in the history of Islam and orthodoxy. Because until 1917, Orthodox Christians, they had a, a czar. The czar was the Holy Roman Emperor. So from the time of Constantine the Great, when he adopted Christianity as the religion of the room, and he even established Constantinia, so from the fourth century until the 20th century, Christians in one way or another they had a Holy Roman Emperor. So there was a descendant of Constantine the Great. The same thing was about Islam. From the seventh century, when our prophet established the state of Medina, for good or for worse, Muslims always had a kind of caliph. You are right, what you said about Muawiyah and other dynasties which established the kingdom, but still, even though we'll have kings and dictators taking power, still the frames of uh, Muslim kingdoms were based in the Sharia. But then what happens is that with the killing of the Tsar in 1918 and the uh, 
taking hostage of the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed VI, Muslims were suddenly left yatim, orphans. The slogan that uh, Ottoman ulamas had when they were fighting against non-Muslim powers was that we fight for din ve devlet. So the ideology of the Ottomans was that we cannot have religion unless we have state. Devlet in Ottoman means state, and din means religion. But now, what happens from 1917 to 1918, suddenly Muslims are left, and Orthodox Christians as well, are left without a religious state. And what we will see happening is that in Russia, we'll have a massive process of atheistization and programs of Christians. We'll have churches being burned, priests being killed by the Bolsheviks. And the same thing will happen in the ex-Ottoman space. In Turkey, in the Balkans, we'll have mosques being burned madrasas closed, ulamas executed. And suddenly, what the Peace Conference of Paris of 1918, 1919 will bring about, they will establish a new world order, a secular world order, an old world order where religion became the enemy. So what French masonry started in France in 17. 89, when they toppled the king and they destroyed the church. World War I will bring a global triumph of the international masonry. And by the way, the Jean Turks, they belong to the Grand Lodge of Orient, the French reach of masonry. So we will have a wave of anti-religious massacres and hatreds, which will happen from Istanbul to Moscow. Priests and imams, ulamas and bishops will be executed. And the 20th century will be a century of nightmares. We'll have extreme nationalist ideas. The Germans, the French, the Italians, the Greeks, the Bulgars, everybody will go against everybody. And these colonialist powers, they are going to instill the hatred of nationalism even in the Arab world. Until today, if you go to Saudi Arabia and you talk with Saudis, you ask them about the Turks, they say, oh, they were colonizers, they colonized us. But when you tell them, what about the British and the Americans and the Zionists, they say, no, 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 they're our friends. Mm -hmm. So what the colonialists are going to do, they're going to instill hatred in name of nationalism. And what will happen to Muslims? First of all, they're going to lose their caliph. And secondly, they're going to go back to the jahiliya, mm -hmm. to the pre-Islamic jahiliya. We know very well the history of our prophet. When our prophet brought Islam, his greatest enemy were the Quraysh. Mm -hmm. Because the Quraysh were telling to him, we are the best of the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And they were telling to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are being followed by women and slaves. But our prophet said, Maferke Baina Arabi Wajami. There is no difference between the Arab and non Arab. And many of the followers of our prophet, from Bilal al Habashi to Salman al Farisi, they were not Arabs. Because our prophet brought egalite, brought equality. It was not important if you were a Turk or an Arab or Albanian or a Pakistani in the time of the prophet. But now the new world order, which will be established after World War I, will be a world order which is going to promote atheism, secularism, and hatred against nationalism. It, and nationalism. And this will bring a distraction to humanity that has never been seen before. So, I mean, World War I, I think, is one of the major signs, probably, you know better than me, of, of a major cataclysm for humanity. Because from the time of Prophet Solomon to the time of Prophet Muhammad, humanity 
had inherited a religious state, be it in a Catholic form, in Orthodox form, or Islamic form. But World War I will construct a new reality, which was never seen before. And this will bring about major crimes, genocides, and destruction of humanity in a global scale. We need to identify the role played by the Zionist movement during this strict, strict, this very important period of time until 1918 um, and the, the Treaty of uh, the Conference of Versailles 1919 and it is on your scholarship although I am a student of international relations myself uh, but you have a more profound knowledge of this subject. The role played by the Zionist movement. I have this book here, which I have not found the time to read as yet. Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. We know that there is some truth there, that the, Bol the Wall Street was involved in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Um, uh, uh, in 1907 or 1908, I don't know which one, Britain and France set a trap for Russia. And Russia was so innocent at that time, Russia walked into the trap. They said to Russia, the Ottoman Empire is the sick man of Europe and it's going to collapse soon. There's a big war coming. And we are inviting you to join with us in that war. What they didn't say, if we want you to be the guinea pig to do all the fighting, <laughs> so all those who will be killed will be Russians. We're inviting you to join with us in a triple alliance to fight in that war which is coming. And we promise you that if you join us in that war, we will give you Constantinople. And it was put in writing. There's a secret treaty. And Russia fell for the trap. What we don't know is where is the evidence of the Zionists involved in this planning. British, British government was already becoming a Zionist government. Hmm? When, the British, when the Russian armed forces were an arm's length away from Constantinople in 1917, that is when they struck. They did not want Russia to get Constantinople, although they had put it in a treaty. They were being deceptive. And then Wall Street struck and the Bolshevik Revolution took place. As soon as the Bolsheviks took over from the Tsar, they pulled Russia out of the war. So goodbye, Constantinople. And then they published the treaty which was said to a secret in which Britain and France had promised Russia will give you Constantinople. What we need from you, Osli, Osli, is an effort to try to put in the, into the analysis the role played by the Zionist movement in these events which lasted until the Treaty, the Treaty of Versailles in, 20, in 1919, the role played by the Zionist movement, because all of this is connected with Jerusalem. Something that I would like to add into this discussion is that the British and the Zionists, they were very determined to kill once and for all the institution of the caliphate. Something that uh, I want your viewers to learn is that 
when the British will sponsor Ataturk, who was an officer for the Ottoman Sultan, to leave Istanbul in 1919, if I'm not wrong about the year, they gave him a visa and sent him to Ankara to mobilize the Turkish resistance against the Greek and the Armenian and uh, other invaders. Uh, what is very interesting, there is a book by Andrew Mango called Ataturk, the biography of the founder of modern Turkey, is that while Ataturk was building his power base in Anatolia against the Sultan, the budget for his state was being paid by the Bolsheviks. Okay. So money was coming from the Bolsheviks to pay Ataturk. From Wall Street to the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks from the Bolsheviks to Ataturk. Thank you for this information, all yes. three. It's a very nice book by Andrew Mango. And uh, later on, after he succeeded, he will have agreements with the French and with the British for the establishment of the Republic of Turkey. But the agreement for Ataturk, for him taking power, was that he had to end the Sultanate, which he ended it in 1922 and 23. And finally, in March 1924, the Grand Assembly of Turkey abolished the Caliphate. The institution which, for Muslims, was created by Hazreti Abu Bakr and Umar. And what is very interesting that I want your viewers to know that Sharif, the famous Sharif Hussein, uh, the step, uh, the great grandfather of, uh, Hussein, bin of Ali. Hussein bin Ali, the Sheriff of Mecca, mm. who was appointed in this position by Sultan Abdul Hamid. 1916. But who hated the Jean Turks very much, and this is the reason how the British, the Young Turks, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Young Turks and this is the reason how the British tricked him and told him, look, these Young Turks, they are Kafirs, so you join us and we will give you an Arab Caliphate. So Sheriff Hussein, who joined the British to fight against the Ottomans, when the peace conference of Versailles or of Paris happens, and he sees that the British and the French, they betray the Arabs, and moreover, they stole Palestine and they gave it to the Jews, in March 19, 24, when Ataturk abolishes the caliphate, he declares himself a caliph. Four days later. Yes. And the, the plan of the British was that in order to reward Sharif Hussein for the betrayal that he did to the Ottomans, they will create a kingdom in Iraq, a kingdom in Jordan, and they will also put his uh, sons to rule over Iraq, Jordan. They promised to Sharif even Syria, but Syria was promised to the French. And uh, General Henry Garot, who had his, if I'm not wrong, left hand cut by Muslim Ottomans during the Battle of Gallipoli, he will invade Syria. And uh, he is very famously remembered that when he will enter in Damascus, he will go to the grave of Salahuddin al Ayyubi. He is going to spit on his grave and he will tell to him, Saladin, wake up because we return. Mm -hmm. But let me come back to Sharif Hussein. Uh, when Ataturk abolishes the caliphate, Sharif Hussein, who was left now desperate to rule over Mecca and Medina into what the British under. Uh, their colonial secretary uh, and who will be even prime minister during World War II, forgot the name. Mohan? No, 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 during World War II. Uh, oh, World War II, okay. Uh, forgot the name, the famous one who fought against Hitler. Uh, no, 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 who fought in World War II, okay. I forgot the name. So while the British had designed that they will give Sharif Hussein a state in Hijaz, the state will be from Taif to probably Gulf of Aqaba, which will be known as the, as the Kingdom of Hijaz or Mamlaka al Hijazia. When Sharif Hussein, who will be desperate 
and who will repent for what he did against the Ottomans and will declare himself the caliph, the new caliph of Muslims, the British are going to order the Sultan of Najd, Abdulaziz bin Saud. They were going even to pay him to attack and invade Mecca and Medina. So Saudi Arabia or, or, the, or the, the Sultanate of the Saudis, which was in, in Najd, which was not part of these equations, suddenly became important. The Saudis, they will be paid by the British in order to invade Mecca and Medina and to give an end to this crazy, cheated old man, Sharif Hussein, who, while the British were very successful on killing the Ottoman Caliphate, he suddenly wanted to become the new Pope of Islam, ruling from Mecca and Medina. And I want the viewers to see the bigger picture here, that World War I was a war that was directed against Christian orthodoxy. This is for your Russian and Orthodox viewers to understand how the plot and the sending of the Bolsheviks in, in St. Petersburg was a calculated step to end Christian orthodoxy. And then it was to give a final death blow to Islam. And Saudi Arabia was created as a state as a reward for what they did to the caliphate of Hijaz. And until today, one of the missions of Saudi Arabia is not to allow the establishment of any caliphate over the two holy cities of Mecca and Medina. I am very happy, uh, obviously, to see that you have this uh, um, profound knowledge of the history of this period. I've never come across another scholar in my lifetime who has this knowledge that you have. Uh, in fact, there is um, a very valuable work which was edited by Arnold Toynbee. And Arnold Toynbee is not a crooked man. No, I have to give him credit for integrity, Arnold Toynbee. That uh, he, he edited the Survey of International Affairs every year during this period of time. And if you read the Survey of International Affairs, I think it was 1925 or 1926, which I read at the Library of the United Nations in Geneva when I was a doctoral student. He gave us the information that the British were paying Hussein, Sharif Hussein bin Ali uh, seven million pounds a year for his alliance. And they were giving Abdulaziz Ab ibn Saud some 500,000 pounds for his alliance with them. So both of these were sold out. But you are right. When Sharif Hussein made the disastrous error, four days after Abdul, um, the Turkish Grand National Assembly on the 4th of March 2024, 1924, when they formally abolished the Khilafat, it was already finished. It was just a, <laughs> a paper killer, caliphate that existed from 1908 to 1924. As soon as that Turkish National Assembly abolished the caliphate on the 4th of March, 1924, four days later, Hussein bin Ali um, made this disastrous error that the British never forgave him for, of claiming the Khilafat, because whatever alliance the British had with Hussein bin Ali and with Saud did not include a revival of the Caliphate. The Caliphate must go once and for all. So they, they paid Saud to come and attack Mecca. Hussein bin Ali had to flee. The British put him in a ship and took him, I think, to Cyprus, Cyprus. to exile. And they gave his sons what they had promised, yeah. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to uh, give this detail that the new design for the Muslim world 
uh, was in a way settled during the Cairo Conference of uh, 1921. <clears throat> the new design for the world of Islam was settled at the Cairo Conference of 1921? Cairo of 1926? Uh, no, 21. And Which uh, is another conference yeah, then? Under Winston Churchill, who in this time... Okay, so okay. He was uh, the Prime Minister, I put, was, uh, because I mentioned to you. So, the design of Churchill was that uh, Sharif bin Ali will have the kingdom of Hijaz, but his son will take power and he was supposed to retire. So when he did the m mistake that you mentioned, that he wanted to become a kind of pope. I mean, like we have nowadays uh, the pope in the Vatican. Who is that? <coughs> Sharif? Yeah, Sharif Hussein. I mean, when he declared himself a caliph. No, I don't Sh think. Sharif bin Ali, sorry. I don't think he, w I think he, he sincerely wanted to bring back the Khilafah to the Arab world. It is in 1922 that Mustafa Kamal argued that in the same way that Western Christianity can have a Pope, yeah. we don't need to abolish the Khilafat. We, our Caliph will be our Pope. <laughs> so in 1922, it was Abdul Majid, who was shown of all temporal powers now. And he's simply like a Pope now, 22 to 24. And then 24, there was the, the, um, the final coup that uh, finished of the Khilafat. But there's something I want to share with you. And then there was a Khilafat movement in India, which had become a very powerful, in fact, the most powerful movement of resistance to British rule anywhere in the world was the Khilafat movement in India. And it was led by men who knew Islam and who lived Islam. And miraculously so, they were able to build a Hindu-Muslim alliance. When Mohandas Gandhi said to Maulana Abdul Bari, the head of the Khilafat movement, the same thing that you want, so too I want it. We want the British out. Let's come together. And the Khilafat leadership said, yes, we're ready. And an alliance was formed. And that was the most powerful movement of all. When the First World War took place and the Ottoman Empire was being dismembered, it causes consternation all over India. And the Indian Muslims were agitating against the British rule in India and it was causing problems for Britain. And uh, a man called the Aga Khan together with another famous British Indian legal thinker, both of them approached the British government. First of all, they published a letter in the, in the London Times, and they approached the British government on behalf of the Caliphate. Because Mustafa Kamal had said in 22, we don't need to abolish the Caliphate. You have the Pope, so we can have a caliph with a Pope. And when Mustafa Kamal saw what the British, what the Indian Muslims were doing with Britain, that provoked the, the Turkish National Assembly in March of 24 to finally abolish the caliphate because they felt this was a threat, what the Indian Muslims were doing. I wanted to just include this in our discussion. Yes, please continue. Yeah, and uh, because I want to come back to the issue of theology, because what happened in 1924, in my opinion, was a major disaster for the history of Sunni Islam. Because until 1924, to be a Sunni, it meant that you had a caliph. Like nowadays, to be a Catholic means that you believe in a pope those Catholics who don't believe in a Pope, they are Protestants. So what happened after 1924, when the British were very happy with uh, Ataturk abolishing the Caliphate and they removed Sharif Hussein from power, from 1924 to this year, 2024, Sunni Muslims in a global scale, they do not have a Pope. 
Catholicism had this kind of crisis from the 1870s, the creation of the Italian Republic, to 1929, when the Kingdom of uh, Italy under Prime Minister Benito Mussolini will sign the Lateran Accords with the Catholic Church, where the Italian state will somehow recognize the Vatican as a state of Catholicism. While Catholicism, in a way, managed to preserve its papacy, Sunni Islam, until today, haven't been able to preserve the caliphate. And the same thing, I think, goes even for the Orthodox Christians. Scholars like Alexander Dugin, they want to depict Putin as the new czar of Russia. But until today, there is no czar and there is no caliph for Islam and Orthodoxy. I want Sheikh Imran, if you can, in the conclusion of our discussion, to give us your thought about the future of Islam and Orthodox Christianity. Today, uh, in this year, which is the 100th anniversary of the abolition of caliphate as a result of the Great War, which led to the establishment of Israel, and in a way the triumph of Zionism over humanity. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim which was quoted by, by Sheikh um, Muhammad Abu Zahra, the very famous Egyptian legal scholar, uh, when the Caliphate was abolished in 1924, and then Al Azhar University uh, organized an Islamic conference in 1926 to try to deal with the subject of Islam without a caliphate. And uh, I, I wrote a book on this called The Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi Mason State. And I quoted Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahra in uh, that book. Uh, he quoted from Sahih Muslim, uh, in which our Prophet said, Man mata wa lam yara fi unukihi bay'a faqad mata maytatan jahiliya. Whosoever dies without having made the pledge of allegiance, meaning to the Khilafa, to the Khalifa, will die a ja debt of jahiliya. That's the hadith. But when we turn to the Quran, however, there is something else. While the hadith does tell us that the Khilafah state will be restored, and we know it's coming, that we have a great war around the corner, not far from now, and then after that you see the world of Islam immediately rising up with the the army which will conquer Constantinople, either seven months or seven years. That is the revival of the world of Islam, that conquest of Constantinople. And then after that we see the events with Pax Judaica and with Dajjal appearing in person and declaring from Jerusalem that he is the Messiah and so on. This part of our eschatology Eschatology, I have explained many times. What I have not done before, I'm doing it for the first time now. Because there was a powerful voice in Al Azhar University arguing at that time, but he was a lone voice, that it is possible to have an authentic Islam without the state. Adi Abdul Razak was his name. Uh, but his voice was drowned down. And I don't think he argued his case effectively. If we look to the Quran, we see that Allah speaks and says there's only one deen. And it's the deen of Islam, the way of life. The way of life, Islam means the way of life of submission to the one God, that is Islam. So you don't have to be a follower of Prophet Muhammad 
Allah's blessing be upon to be in Islam. All those who came before him were also in Islam. But our schoolboys don't understand that. So the religion started with Ibrahim alayhi islam. This is the man who gave us the religion, the way of life. Before that, it was not yet a way of life. It was the truth, but not yet a way of life. But now the way of life. And our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, is ordered in the Quran to follow the way of Ibrahim Islam. This is the way of the, of the truth, to follow the religion of Abraham. But the religion of Abraham Islam did not have a kingdom, a state. Although the promise is there that you will have the Ali Ibrahim, you're going to have that state. The state never appeared until Nabi Dawood Islam, which is a long, long time. So the religion of Islam, the religion of Islam existed for a thousand years or more without a state. Without a state. So if we don't have a state now since 1924, or maybe a few years before that, we don't have a state until the Imam comes and he restores the Khilafah state in Mecca. It does not imply that you do not have Islam because Islam survived without a state for all that period of time. So during this interim, until the Amma is revived and the Khalifa state is restored, we still can have an authentic Islam. Thank you very much, Sheikh. It was uh, really great to have this discussion with you on uh, World War I and the science of uh, Ahirul Zaman. I hope that our viewers have benefited from the facts that we shared, and uh, I think they will profit a lot from our discussion and to understand better the situation where we are nowadays. Thank you, Dr. Osli, and I'm looking forward to more dialogue with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.